Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Have you ever considered what it takes to be a leader in a business startup? It's not easy, and it takes a special set of skills. My guest today has those skills. Deshaun Russell decided to leave her career in education to manufacture candles. Yes, candles. She decided to give up a predictable job to do something she knew very little about. She entered into the crowded market of candle manufacturing companies and decided to do battle with corporate giants like Yankee Candle. And she's winning. This is a very special episode, and I'm excited to learn from her unique experiences. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Deshaun Russell. Deshaun is the owner of the Southern Elegance Candle Company here in North Carolina. Prior to becoming an entrepreneur, she spent 22 years in education and educational leadership. She started her business the same time I started mine, and I've enjoyed seeing her company grow and prosper. I'm excited to have her on the show today to talk about what leadership is like in a startup company. So Deshaun, welcome. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show. Uh, I've watched your company grow over the years, and I'm just excited to have you and on the show. Talk a little bit about what that's been like. So first of all, start us. tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you initially chose education as a career choice. Because I think where you grew up, I think, ties into what the company's all about. I was originally born in Dothan, Alabama, um, and then we moved to North Carolina near my grandmother in a small town um, in Sampson County. So my grandmothers lived in Roseboro and Clinton. So we spent a lot of time back and forth between my my grandmother and actually both my great grandmothers. So I grew up with all of my great grandmothers, great aunts, great uncles. So I was very blessed to have like a huge extended family. So we literally grew up barefoot uh, on dirt roads, running around in the country. It was like the perfect upbringing. We had no idea, like literally we were dirt poor. Like when people talk about being dirt poor, like that's how poor we were. But you didn't really have any idea that, you know, that's what was happening. We spent times working in the fields during the summer. And uh, so it was a great, like phenomenal childhood. And then we moved to Durham. Well, we moved to Greensboro and then we moved to Durham, but we kind of settled in Durham. And Durham was a totally different kind of environment. So it was like a bigger city. It's one of the biggest cities in North Carolina. So then I had this kind of city-fied kind of <laughs> um, growing up too. So it's like I've had the best of both worlds, uh, big city when I was older, small town when I was younger, and um, huge extended family um, growing up. So why education? Why did you become a teacher right uh, right away? So I'm going to just be honest with you. So my parents came up during a time when um, African Americans were encouraged to have good government jobs um, because anything else was kind of iffy. Even if you started your own business, like literally you didn't know, and I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, but you didn't know if the Klan was going to come and burn it down. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of risky for black people in general to be too fabulous. So my parents kind of wanted me to take a nice, safe job nice and have safe, a nice yeah. safe life. So they encouraged me to go into education because they were like, you know, people are always going to have babies. So it was like, so just be a teacher. It's a nice little job. You can follow your husband. It won't compete with his career. Like those were the types of um, ideas that they were raised with. So that that's pretty much what they told me. So my mom was like, my parents were really like, you know, be a teacher. And that's what I did. I, I became a teacher. And so I joke with her now, like, man, why you didn't tell me to be a doctor or a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more money like I listened to you you should have given me 
parents to be a teacher. That job kind of sucks. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you, I mean, you, you spent a long time in there and, and moved up into leadership positions and what have you. Um, so what was the awakening? What uh, made you decide to leave that whole world and start up a manufacturing company making candles? I mean, that's a big shift and big change. There were a lot of things that happened. I mean, I think about probably around my fifth year, I realized that I haven't sold a bill of goods. So it was like, do all of the right things, you know, get this degree and then, you know, do all of the right things and you're going to prosper. And I kept getting these little rinky dink checks. And I was like, where's the rest (laughs) of my money? possibly be it (laughs) and so that was the first thing I was like oh my god I'm gonna literally be poor I'm never gonna be able to sustain myself as long as I'm a teacher and then I was like Mm -hmm. okay well maybe if I go back to school and get some more degrees um then and move up the ranks I will make better money and you know have a better life basically so then I was working I did everything I was supposed to do I got a master's I got a uh, EDS I was working on my doctorate I was working as an assistant principal and like literally I was like this is worse than being a teacher like the closer I got to the goal I was like the worst this is stressful and then I looked at my check and it was like literally $50 more and I was like I'm working out all of these hours I got student loan debt now and it's like $50 more and I was like, and I'm trapped. I just felt like, what am I going to do? Because I was told one thing and life is like totally different. Mm. So I was about 40 and then I got pregnant. Mm. And I used that pregnancy as an excuse to just like quit everything. So I was like, I quit my job. I quit um, going to school. I said, I'm going to just be pregnant. I'm going to just take this time to kind of figure out what I want to do with my life. Because I didn't think I could get pregnant. So it was like a huge shift. And then I had a kid. And then now I'm 40 with a baby sitting at home after being this, you know, assistant principal, doctoral student, a lot of, and so I was going crazy. And I took a job just to kind of get out the house. And the principal there, um, I would, I refused to take a real job, like um, with responsibility, but I did agree to be like a grade level chair. Mm. And I started making stuff for the teachers because teaching really does kind of suck. And so to kind of bring a little bit of joy to their day, I learned how to make stuff. So I would bring in sugar scrubs. I might bring in some soap. I might bring like whatever little thing that I had learned how to make for my son. Um, I would bring in to work and they were like, oh, this, this stuff is good. But them candles that you make, can I get another one of those? Oh. And so that started me you know, like, okay, but it was still a side high because I had invested so much of my life into education and training and being a, you know, a teacher or an assistant principal. And I had all these goals that I really felt like it was a side hustle. Mm. And then mm. one day I walked into work and I was like, I hate this place. I hate these <laughs> I hate this place. These parents are nuts. I'm looking at this check. I'm like, man, I ain't making much more money than when I started. I'm going to be poor forever. I went back to that and I was like, I quit. And people were like, what are you going to do? And I said, I will make candles before I come back up in here. I don't care. And that's what happened. I had no plan, no experience, no background, no nothing. I was just like, you know what? I got, I was about 45 at the time. I was like, man, I got about 40 good years left. I'll be grown like longer than, you know, ahead in the future that, you know, looking back, I'm like, I only been really grown about a good 25 years. So I was like, I got 40 left. Oh, we're done with this. And I was going to see, I'm just going to take my chances. I'm going to bet on black. And I chucked them just and I never looked back. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a great story. So um, candles, I mean, you're, you're doing a great job. So tell us a little bit about Southern Elegance Candle Company. What is the main focus? What are you trying to do differently than other companies that are out there? So, like I said, I didn't know anything. First off, I didn't even really know any companies that were out there. I just said, I need to create a product that I can talk about authentically. Oh, so nice. what can I do? You know, I knew I needed a brand. I didn't really know what a brand was. I didn't really know how to build a brand, but I knew it had to be cohesive and it had to be authentic, authentic and something that I could speak on. So I said, you know what, I'm going to just 
um, create a company around all of the things that I love about being in the South. Because my husband is military and we had traveled different places and I always wanted to come home. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to create a company around Southern living and Southern agriculture and all of these like memories that I had from my grandmother, my great grandmother growing up on the dirt road, working in the fields. Like I'm just going to create something around that. And that's how Southern Elegance pretty much came into existence. So all of our fragrances literally are based off of Southern agriculture and all of the cities or places that I visited or now, you know, it's people, I have a whole team that work with me or places that we have visited. And then we create a story around that candle. That's fantastic. So what are some examples I've heard recently you're talking about? Um, what the Durham candle and uh, the smells of Durham in the early years. So, but what are some of the scents that you have? What are some of the candles that you have in the company? So we have a, we have a Southern sunshine candle, which is all, of, it's like really citrusy. We have a Southern nights candles, which is current and sandalwood, which is kind of sexy and woodsy. We have a Nashville candle, which is honeysuckle. We have a New Orleans, which is magnolia. Of course, we have a Lexington, which is apple bourbon and it smells amazing. It's one of my favorite Williamsburg. That was like one of the first times when I went to colonial Williamsburg, I was in high school and it was the first time I had traveled like out of state without my parents. I went on a school trip to Williamsburg and I still remember this. So I created a whole candle um, around Williamsburg with pineapple sage. Um, we have a back rose candle. It smells amazing. It's like one of my, it's quickly become one of my favorites. The Carolina pine candle smells like straight Christmas. We love it. Like when we first start making it in about October, but then by December, we're like, Lord, can Christmas be over? <laughs> <laughs> we can't take it no more. So, um, but yeah, we just have a variety and every year we introduce new scents. Um, and then each uh, holiday season, we introduce new scents. So like this season, we got sweet potato, sugar plum, um, vanilla Noel, winter cranberry. So it just kind of depends in, on the season and how we're feeling and the vibe that we're going for, for that particular iteration of the candles that we release. Wow. Wow. So what, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine you, you spend a career learning how to be a teacher, learning how to be an educator, learning how to lead in, in, in school systems. And you got tired of it. You threw, you said, I'm going to do it all on my own and I'm going to go make candles. So, I mean, how did you learn how to make candles? How did you know how to find scents? And I mean, you're talking about competing against in some cases, major brands with armies of people that, uh, that, that, that know sense and they know trends and they know all this. So how do you, how do you compete against these large companies with very large armies and, and you're coming into it new? So what, what's that experience been like for you? Number one, I didn't have any idea what I was doing. So I think when you don't know that you're going up against, you know, Goliath, you just don't, you just don't know. So when you don't know something, you just come up with a plan and go, okay, so this is what we're going to try. And so we've tried, I've tried things that work really well. And then I've tried things that kind of sucked. I've wasted money, you know, paying fancy firms to do stuff. So, um, but what I found is I learned how to make candles literally by watching YouTube videos. Mm. Um, I learned how to set my factory up by watching big candle companies, like how they had set up their factories on YouTube videos. The first couple of years, I, any skill that I needed to learn, I literally Googled it and watched YouTube videos. I read a ton of articles. I took a class. I hired coaches. I did whatever I needed to do in order to learn what I needed to know. Mm. And that's what I did. So, you know, I'm not one of those people that think anybody can be an entrepreneur. I, I really don't think anybody can be one. I think you have to be a type A driven, willing to give up sleep, willing to grind it out, willing to learn whatever it is you're willing to learn, um, willing to lose everything um, in order to make it work kind of person, because that's literally what I had to do. And the only people that I see that are super successful are the people with that same kind of attitude. So I did literally whatever it took. I hired coaches and I hired the best coaches that I could afford. I would sell candles at flea markets and, you know, church bazaars. I don't care. I, fairs. 
I don't care. I would sell my trunk, my trunk if I had to. Like I did whatever I had to do, and then I took that money and I bought the best photography that I could buy. I bought the best copywriter that I could buy. I bought the best coach to teach me how to do Facebook ads that I could buy. So I took all of the money that I made and I invested it right back into the company, and I continued to learn how to do everything pretty much on my own. I tell people in the beginning, when you start a business, either you're going to have a lot of time or you're going to have a lot of money. So if you get investments and people are say, oh, you got this great idea. Here's a, you know, a million dollars. And now you got a lot of money. You can hire people, but you probably don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a lot of time. I didn't have a lot of money. So I had to learn how to do stuff. And so now it's a little flip. We're making the money, <laughs> but I don't have a lot of time. So, but in the beginning, I just took all of that time that I had and learned how to really, there's nothing in my company that I cannot do. There is no job there. Some of them I suck at now, <laughs> but there is not a job that I can't do because I literally built it brick by brick. That's awesome. In fact, I was just telling my son was working at my factory today and I told him that there's no job in the factory I can't do except one and that's testing our products, electrical testing. Uh, I haven't learned that job yet, but everything else I can do and in, 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 and occasionally I'll do. I'll just, mm -hmm. when we're busy, I just head out to the factory and just help out and I enjoy it. It's fun to you know, to work with your hands and you know, be around my team. And, uh, and, you know, it's, you know, I did 22 years in corporate. So similar to you is almost the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, like you, I got fed up with just corporate living and corporate life and just all that goes along with it. And, uh, so I went from, you know, being a guy with a conference room and a fancy office to now I wear boots and jeans and t-shirts <laughs> and I love every day. So mm -hmm. just a, a different uh, way to do it. So, what I mean, as you're growing now, I know you're hiring a lot more people. Now you're kind of and, and you know, you used to do everything by yourself. Now you have a team around you, you have people around you. What's been the leadership challenges of growing a startup company like this? Everything. <laughs> Everything, everything is a learning curve. Oh my God, everything has been a learning curve because you think it's going to be one way. Like you think you're going to go out and you're going to find all these fabulous people that believe in your vision and they're going to come on board and make the best candles ever. Not my, I, I hired, uh, last, well, a couple of years ago, I fired everybody during the holiday season because their attitude was, um, why do you get all the credit and we do all of the work? Oh. I was like, wait, <laughs> I was like, honey, you fired. And then I fired all her friends. I was like, dude, I, if this is the attitude, like I just fired everybody. And I just started from scratch and I was like, I'll get in here. And it was like literally during November. And I was like, I'll just hire new people and train new people. Um, so hiring and firing has been a challenge. Choosing the right people and putting them in the right position. Like, Luckily, I was a teacher, so I kind of know that it takes all kinds to make a world. And so mm. you're going to get a variety of people. You can't have all of these type A personalities like myself. So my executive assistant now, like she is so even keel. So I might be like going crazy and she's just looking at me like, it's going to be OK. Mm. We're going to get we're going to get through this, you know, and that position is like, like perfect for her. So um, just finding the right people and getting them in the right place. And I am not like some kind of trained leader. I am nuts on any given day. So I'm not typical at all. Like I talk to my team, like we're all, you know, they know I'm the boss, but I don't be walking around like I'm the boss, you know? So we have, um, I had to learn how to empower them so that they felt responsible enough to make a decision and still know that I'm the boss and still not walk around like I'm the boss. So finding right. balance right. has been a challenge for me. Um, and quite frankly, I cuss a lot. So on any given day, I might just say some old crazy stuff to my team and they're looking at me like, are you supposed to be saying this? And I'll be like, hell, I don't know. We make the rules. We, we decide what's professional here because whatever we decide is okay. Like literally that is what is okay here. So it's kind of relaxed the environment a lot. And people like love, my team loves coming to work. That's good. But everything about it has been um, difficult because you think, again, you read the book, you think it's going to go one way. And then you get out in the real world and you go, what? These people, some of these people are stupid that I hire. I'm like, oh my God, you can't. Oh, like literally, I just be like, man, you're not smart enough to be in charge of anything. 
where can I put you? Like, I'm not even being funny. Like, where can I put you? Okay. Mm-hmm. You are the best labeler in this, in this whole facility. Like your labels are straight and on point every single time. So I might not put you in charge of anybody, but this job you excel at, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like making those kind of decisions. Um, it's just, <laughs> I don't know. Like this is being a being a boss is not, you know, everybody want to be a boss. You know, I think I read a quote that it says everybody wants to be the lion until you got to go out there and do lion shit. And then it's like, yeah, you don't want to kill the, you know, yeah. the, the, what, the, what, the antelope and drag it home. You just want to, you know, walk around and be, you know, the king of the jungle. So that's mm-hmm. kind of how it is when you are the boss. Everybody want to be a boss until you got to fire somebody. And the whole team is mad at you for because they like that person, but that person wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. Right. So it's like finding that balance of, oh, I, I, I said a whole bunch of cuss words just now. I'm sorry. Like no, I said, it was just one. But yeah, I'm, okay, well, the real meaning. Now, you know, I'm a former sailor, you know, I'm a former <laughs> sailor. So I, it's not like I hadn't heard it. it it's, it's, that's just how it is. You know, everybody wants to be the boss. Everybody wants to yeah. be the king of the jungle until you got to go and chop off some heads. And then it's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I want to do this anymore. Right, so, right. Well, one thing, one thing I, 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 I struggle with, or I want to make sure I do with my company, is that I had a vision for the company. I'm, I'm building it. I have a vision for what I want my company to be, and I'm sure you have a vision as what you want your company to be. So, how do you make sure that you know, as you bring in new employees, if you have new people, how do you make sure that the vision for what you have in mind for what your company is going to look like, how do you make sure that um, that they're getting the vision? They understand the vision. Is it a daily conversation? Is it just how do you reinforce what you want the company to be to these new employees? We talk about it all the time. Like we talk about the challenges of being the vast majority of my employees are black or brown people. So I, we talk about the challenges and the stereotypes that come along with being a company with the vast majority of the people that work in the company come from some um, disadvantaged group, be it female, be it um, Native American, be it um, Hispanic, be it Black, be it we, we have older people. Um, so I, we talk about that like all the time and I impress upon them like it is imperative that everything that we send out the do- out the door has to exceed people's expectations mm. because the bar is so low that they're not expecting like this great quality product that they get and when they get it they are blown over I said it, and so we talk about this we I don't have the kind of company where we don't we have hard conversations we have incredibly hard conversations all the time I have a young girl that's in charge of production and she is smart as a whip and she is phenomenal and I said honey I'm about to put you in charge of a bunch of stuff are you ready and I said now let me tell you all of the the challenges that you're going to have you're going to have to deal with racism you're going to have to deal with sexism you're going to have to deal with classism you're going to have to deal with ageism because you're young are you ready to deal with these things because these are the things that you're going to have to deal with you can't just be popping off arguing with people you got to learn how to be a leader So we have like really, really hard conversations um, and nothing pretty much is off limit. We talk about everything. We talk about, you know, whatever kind of challenges we're having. It is is uh, is open. So Mm, that I think makes it keeps everybody on track. It really keeps everybody on track because it's brutal honesty about how we run the company and what the expectations are. And that if they don't rise to the challenge, I'm going to fire them. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Deep Leadership is brought to you by Strikeforce Energy. Strikeforce Energy is a veteran-owned company founded by a Navy SEAL and their products are all made in the USA. Strikeforce Energy is a liquid flavor pack that you can add into any beverage. It has zero calories, zero carbs, and zero sugar. Each pack contains 80 milligrams of caffeine. Strikeforce Energy is offering a discount to all the listeners of Deep Leadership. Go to strikeforceenergy.com and enter the discount code I have the watch, one word, for a 20% discount on every order. Deep Leadership is also brought to you by my Amazon best selling book, I Have the Watch Becoming a Leader Worth Following. This book is filled with 23 short stories on how you can become a more effective leader. 
It's super easy to read and most people finish it in less than two hours. Go to IHaveTheWatch.com and click the large orange button for signed copies. Enter the discount code IHaveTheWatch, one word, at checkout for 20% off your order and domestic shipping is always free. One thing that's interesting about being an entrepreneur, because I'm in I'm in your shoes as well, is I think, and I think it sounds like you do a really good job at this, is that you have to be grounded with reality. You have to face the reality of the moment, whether it's cash being low or sales being low, or you're running out of a wick or you're running out of you know raw material. You're facing the reality of the situation, but you also have your eye towards the future. So you have to be realistic with where I'm at today but also kind of thinking about where you want the company to be. How do you do that on a daily basis? I know that's a struggle for me sometimes because I'm like, you know, I see where we're at with sales and it's so much better than we were last month, but I want to, I I have this vision of where we want, where I want this to be. So I feel like, you know, my, 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 sometimes my employees are like, Oh, we had a great month this month. I'm like, yeah, it's great, but it's not where we want it to be. So how do you, how do you keep those two lenses of, being real with what's happening, but also having a vision for where you want want to go. Radical transparency. Radical. When I tell you radical, so if we do a hundred thousand in sales a month, which we, which we've been consistently doing, I tell them we did a hundred thousand in sales last month, and I spent twenty four thousand dollars on fragrance oil. And then, so they're already like, wait, a fourth of the money is already gone on one thing. I say, yeah. And every pallet of shipping supplies that you come in here is $2,000. And we get two pallets of shipping supplies a week. Those fragrance oils, every one that you see that come in here is $300. Mm. Payroll is $4,000 a week. So when they hear the numbers, they're like, okay. (laughs) It changes everybody's attitude. You know, and I tell them, I may or may not get paid. My salary is the, the last thing that is on the list. Everything else has to get bought, has to get made, has to get out the door, and all of y'all got to be paid before I get paid. So if the numbers don't add up, it's a problem for me, not a problem for you. Mm. So when they see that, they're kind of like, okay, we got we to gotta get orders. Like they'll comment like, hey, we... It's kind of slow. We're not getting enough orders. I'm like, you're right, because if we don't get enough orders, y'all ain't going to get enough hours. So it's all, they understand the connection between the more orders we get, the more money we make, the more supplies we need, and they they understand that whole connection. So there's no mis- misconception like I'm rolling in the dough because I had a good month. I had a good month, but now we're scaling. We got an order for 10,000 candles. So 10,000 candles, just a vessel, you know what I'm saying? That's twenty thousand dollars right there. Yeah, yeah. That's... You know, and so when we start talking about the numbers, like I say, radical transparency. Yeah, people don't realize one of the hardest things that small companies can do is grow because mm-hmm. you need cash to be able to buy the raw materials and get it out the door, and so it's it's a challenge. I know we're growing rapidly as well, and it's just. You know, I, I'm writing big checks to suppliers and you're, you're just watching the bank account every every day in the morning and in the afternoon. What yep. do I have for cash? Right. So yep, every single day. And when I order, when somebody says, hey, we need new labels. I said, come on, let's go order them. I ordered them today. We ordered one hundred thousand labels and it was like two thousand dollars. I said, yeah. So when y'all start coming to me saying, I need this, I want you to understand what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. So it makes them a little bit more aware of what they are doing when they come to me. Because I'm like, do we really need it? And most of the time when they come to me, it's something it is really a need um, Mm -hmm. because they understand the cost and how it affects the overall balance sheet of the business, quite frankly. Mm, It's sure. So, yeah, it's so true. Absolutely. What what motivates you? I, I I can see a little bit, and I'm just kind of curious. What what drives you? I mean, you're you are, you know, as you said, the last five years, four and a half years, you've been working your tail off to get this company off the ground, right? Now you're starting to get noticed. You're starting to grow in, in a big way. But what drives you? What's your real passion for this company? 
Okay, so it's twofold. Okay. Number one, I like being number one. <laughs> so I like being at the top. I like when somebody says Deshaun Russell, they're like, okay, she's the real deal. Because sometimes, you know, these people, they're entrepreneurs, but they ain't really entrepreneurs. Yes. So they, you know, they ain't signing no checks. They're not worrying about the bottom line. They're not looking at profit and loss statements. They out here faking their friends. So when people say Deshaun Russell, what they're going to say is she's the real deal. The second thing is when they get our product, it's on par with any premium brand candle that's out there or home fragrance product um, because we make a variety of products now. So those are the two things that drive me. But both of them are about being at the top of my game at all times. I think I was just driven like that when I was a teacher. I used to tell my kids um, our scores are going to be the best. I stayed in the top 10% of teachers in the state of North Carolina. Like my entire career, I was in the, that. Time. They only give you the top 10. I'm like, I was probably in the top 1%, but they only tell you the top 10. <laughs> I was always at the top. So again, that goes back into some intrinsic thing that certain people have to grow. Because if you don't really have that kind of fire and desire, there are days where it's going to be so hard that you'd be like, man, I, don't, I quit. I ain't doing this. But if you're like, nope, I'm going to be number one. Yeah. And honestly, like there are some people that started with me and I probably shouldn't even say this and I don't care what I'm saying anyway. They started with me and they couldn't hang. Yeah. They can't hang. They talk all that trash in the beginning. And I look at them now like, where you at? Where you at yeah. now? Where yeah. you at? What you doing? How many stores you in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So that really, like, knowing that I survive when a lot of people can't, man, yeah. come on now. You, you know, that, that'll get you up in the morning. So, you know, it's funny. It's almost like I'm driven the same way. It's a, like a chip on my shoulder. Like, mm -hmm. I want to prove to the world that we could do this, that we, we, we put a dent in the universe. We we change things in our industry. You know, we're doing something different. And I think that gets me up every morning to try, because I'm going up against 40, 100 billion, $150 billion companies every day. And mm -hmm. my thing is like, you know, it's a David and Goliath. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what we can do with our little team here. And we're going to we're going to kick your ass. And that's exactly. the mindset that I have. So <laughs> Exactly. And that's my mindset. I'm like, okay, Yankee. <laughs> I'm coming for you. Like, I'm coming for you. My goal, I listen, I tell everybody, I'm be like the black Paula Dean. I'm gonna have my son and Ellis gonna be on everything. I'm gonna be on pots, pans, kitchen towels, home fragrance products. Like, I'm not in this to play around. I'm in this to take over and mm -hmm. make a huge difference and make people notice like our little brand to the point where they get, hey, hey, you, we just gonna buy you and shut you up. What, what's your <laughs> That's my plan. I love it. I love it. I, I just love it. I mean, um, it's funny. Um, there's a there's a book by Angela Duckworth called Grit, and she talks about the thing that what grit is is passion and persistence for the long for the long term. And I think if you are an entrepreneur, if you want to get into this world of of starting a business, you better have passion for what you want to do, and mm -hmm. you better have that persistence. Like no matter what comes your way, you're going to go through it, uh, over it, around it, but you're going to overcome it because you have a long-term goal, you have a passion and you want to get to a certain place. And I definitely see that in you. And maybe that's why I'm so attracted to what <laughs> you're doing and your brand and, and what you're doing uh, and how you're growing it. I think it's uh, really exciting. So, so what's, what's next with your company? What's going on? I keep seeing you bring in more and more equipment into your factory. So what's going on? We can't talk about it. <laughs> All right. We can't talk about it. <laughs> phone call today from somebody because we've been getting a lot of pressure. It's like, um, I hope you ain't been talking about what we're doing. And I was like, no, they asked me if I, you know, because we were doing some things with a major uh, network. And I was like, no, I, I'm, I'm asking you, can we even mention it? And she's like, no. Yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we got a lot of stuff that we are working on that will just like roll out in the next like about eight weeks. I mean, partnership with major, major, major corporations that I didn't call. They called me. Yes. Like chains with like 600 stores throughout the Southeast, major uh, international corporations, major um, international brands like that we have partnerships with that are just coming out um, between now and like November that I just cannot talk about. So it's like ah, you just see, like if you follow us on social media, you're like she just bought a 420 pound wax melter. <laughs> 
And I listen, when I went, I, I, I called a dude, I said, listen, I need this uh, wax melter because I've been looking at it for a while. And he was like, what you need that for? Don't you need one of these little ones? I, and I was like, what? No, I need th- this bigger one. And I'm trying to figure out how big am I going to get it? And so he really didn't believe that I needed the melter, the size that I needed. Um, but we went back and forth and they ended up selling it to me. I want them over and they, they put me ahead of schedule and got it to me like the next week. So um, I saw you had a contest to name it. Did you name the, 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 uh, yes, the, the biggest one is going to be called big Bertha. And, um, <laughs> so we're naming, now we're naming the other, how many melters do we have? The other four, I think one, two, three, four. Yeah. So we're coming up with um, four other names for, for the melters, but that's just the beginning. Um, I'm sure we're going to, yeah, that's just the beginning. We got some huge partnerships coming up. Ah, that's really exciting. So, um, so I've, I'm, I'm asking this to all my guests, and I'm kind of curious to get your response. And if, I think your response will be interesting. So, what would you say are some characteristics of a great leader? You know, I think number one, passion. Because if you are not like if you don't if you don't know what you want. You're willing to go in a whole bunch of different ways. Whereas I know exactly what we need and I'm passionate about getting it. That passion kind of feeds off on everybody. Now, I can be a little bit too passionate at times and my team be like, hey, bring that down a notch. But if you don't have that every day when you walk in that building, like, all right, we are out of jars and we are out of wax, which is what we are right now. The suppliers are out and we're out. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? We're launching the fall since tomorrow. I said, we're going to launch the fall since tomorrow. And they're like, we're out of jars. <laughs> we're out of wax. What are you talking about? We, how are we doing it? We'll figure it out. And so like they believe in, they, they believe it's going to be fine because I believe it's going to be fine. So I think that like that is the number one thing. When you make a mistake, you make a bad decision. They know that that mistake and that bad decision came from an honest and true place. And they are more likely to kind of get past it because they know that the decision was you that you made that decision thinking about the best interest of the company and not some kind of wishy washy middly male kind of oh what 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 was what's we's gonna do kind of decision it's a I think this is the best decision for the business and we're gonna go with it and if it's if it derails us we'll just figure out how to get everything back on track but I think that that one thing like really gets people on board and will you know get them to help you make decisions even when you're not sure like what to do because they'll just feed off of that passion Mm -hmm. so I think that that is the one thing and then of course you know you you gotta kind of figure some stuff out you can't just be passionate and still be a horrible boss (laughs) you still gotta know a few things but generally speaking one thing I tell people all the time is I'm the boss. I make the rules. So we create the kind of culture and the kind of environment that we want here. So whatever works best for this place, that's what we're going to do. And so they kind of help me become a better boss. That's great. That's fantastic. And I like what you said early on, too, about authenticity with the brand. You could speak authentically to it. And I have a feeling that you're pretty authentic with your communication with your people, too. Sometimes too direct because I just say exactly <laughs> like, listen, y'all too slow. And they're like, what? I'm like, I'm an old lady. I'm about 50. If I come in here making candles faster than y'all, it's a problem. Like, it's a problem like you're going to get fired. It's a problem. Not it's a, like a, a little problem. Like if I'm moving faster than you and my knees hurting and my back hurting and you 19, come on now, we got a problem. Y'all better speak it up. You know, so you're exactly right. I'm very like, well, they know there's no... And, but I will say this, there's never any confusion. They never wonder, am I doing a good job? Mm. How does she feel about me? How does she feel about my position here? I tell my team all the time, like, I'm, a, I, I'm appreciative for you being even showing up and coming here and doing this job because you're so fabulous at what you do. And they'll look at me like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, if I don't say it, (laughs) then I don't, you know, I don't believe it. And when I tell them they suck, they know, okay, Mm -hmm. I must really suck because she's already told me that I'm fabulous at this thing. So if she tells me that I'm bad at this thing, like, 
there's no reason for her. You know what I'm saying? I don't work in the middle. Like I'm always like, this is just what it is. I need you to be faster. And this is how fast I need you to be. And if you're not there, like it's going to be a problem, Mm. but it's never any confusion. So people feel secure because they know exactly what it is. I think that's powerful because I think, at least in my time in corporate America, nobody knew how they, where they rated with their boss. Everybody was quiet about it, except we had the annual review, right? So one time a year, you got with your boss and you reviewed your performance. And that was what you did for, and then a year later, you'd have another performance review. I think what you're saying is it's better to do it on real time, real time basis. So let so how can our listeners connect with you and find out more about your company? So you can, you know, I always say, just Google us. <laughs> for most people, that is the easiest thing for them to do. So um, Google Southern Elegance Candle Company. We are going to be the first thing that pops up. Our ad is going to be the first thing that pops up. <laughs> I'll Google that. Um, or you can go to secandleco.com. I would have loved to have Southern Elegance, but it costs $15,000 and we're not paying for that. So we had to do the next best thing. secandleco.com. Um, and just Southern Elegance on every social media platform. Oh, that's great. We'll put links in the show notes uh, and um, so make people can make sure they can find you and they can buy some of your candles, especially the uh, the ones that remind you of uh, southern cities. Right. So yes, uh, especially yes. our oh, southern our yes. southern listeners. Right. Yes. All of my candles <laughs> are fabulous, though. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So I thank you very much, Deshaun, for being on the show. I think you, you shared with us a lot of things that uh, a lot of the reality of what it's like to run a business and lead a business and, you know, facing all the unknowns and and doing with passion. So I really appreciate your time and all that uh, you shared with us today. All right. I really appreciate being here. It has been a blast. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care.